Shabbat Shalom. For those of us who are trying to make sense of the challenges facing American Jewry in 2020, anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, BDS, boycott, divestments and sanctions, intersectionality and otherwise, 1960 is as good a place to start as any. This morning, I'm going to focus on today but I want to get to today by way of yesterday. Three events, three occurrences, three movements, each one anchored in the past, which together provide a prism by which to view the present, and maybe, hopefully, if you stick with me, a path forward into the future. Event number one, eerily resonant given recent news. 60 years ago, January of 1960, a swastika epidemic broke out in Europe. At first, it was at a newly rededicated synagogue in Cologne, Germany, that was vandalized with swastikas, anti-Semitic graffiti, and the words Judenraus, out with the Jews, scrawled onto the walls. But as James Leffler explains in his book, Rooted Cosmopolitans, Jews and Human Rights in the 20th Century, Cologne was just the beginning. In the days, weeks, and months to come, synagogues and Jewish communal buildings throughout Western Germany, London, Antwerp, Vienna, Paris, and here in New York were vandalized. Swastikas appeared in East Germany and Latin America and Hong Kong, Algeria, and South Africa. By the end of 1960, the total would climb to 2,500 incidents in over 40 countries. Historians now know that the swastika epidemic began as a Soviet effort to discredit West Germany in the eyes of the West, a fact then both unknown to the Jews and unimportant to the many, many anti-Semitic copycats who would follow. The epidemic prompted outrage, condemnation, calls to action, and no doubt fear. Think about how we, as an empowered American Jewry of 2020, react to the appearance of swastikas. I shudder to imagine how this outburst of anti-Semitism must have impacted the global Jewish psyche just 15 years after the end of the Holocaust. Had the world learned nothing, would Jews ever be safe? How would the world respond to this virus of Judeophobia? With the epidemic in sw full swing, Maurice Perlswig of the World Jewish Congress called for international action, a UN resolution condemning manifestations of anti-Semitism a story to which we'll return to soon enough. But 1960 was not just the year of the swastika epidemic. In the global community, it was best known as the year of Africa, the second 1960 event of our list of three. Fifteen years prior, Africa had been nearly entirely under colonial rule. The decolonization of these new states in the 1950s brought with them not only a new geopolitical reality, but also a consensus assertion that human rights would be defined not just as protecting the individual from the abuses of power, but that of national rights to self-determination, growing into, in Leffler's words, a vehicle for anti-colonial nationalism. With one notable exception, the emerging Soviet-Arab Afro-Caribbean alignment was committed to the right of self-determination, the notable exception being the Jewish people. Far from reflecting the multi-millennial Jewish hope for self-determination, in the eyes of the global community, Israel was an extension of Western imperialism. An all-out assault on Israel began at the UN in the name of anti-colonialism. When the Israeli delegate Michael Comey lodged a complaint about the omission of anti-Semitism from the resolution being drafted in response to the swastika epidemic, the UN representative from Mauritania blasted Zionist expansionism as the antithesis of human rights, unperturbed both by the fact that his country still permitted legal slavery and that whatever his animus may have been against the Jewish state, 
it had nothing to do with the threat of global anti-Semitism. In the hands of Mali, Nigeria, and the United Arab Republic, who actually accused Zionists of engineering the epidemic, any talk of anti-Semitism was reframed as a Zionist plot. Indeed, by the time the 1962 racism law was actually passed at the UN, the very law prompted by swastikas, anti-Semitism was not even mentioned. A world turned upside down, twice over. First, by its inability to understand Israel as anything other than a nefarious colonialist enterprise, and second, by its inability or unwillingness to differentiate between the safety of a vulnerable global Jewry and the deeds of Israel. Truth be told, I had never heard of the swastika epidemic or the year of Africa until I read Leffler's book. But the third event I did know a bit about, and that was the Eichmann trial. On May 23rd of 1960, Israel's Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion announced to the Knesset and the world that the Nazi leader Adolf Eichmann was under arrest in Israel to stand trial. While we may be well familiar with the impact this announcement and subsequent trial had on the emotions of post-Holocaust Israeli and world Jewry, the transformation of a people from the persecuted to the prosecutor, this morning it's the reaction of the international community upon which I want to focus. The Washington Post scolded Israel's actions as jungle law, the capture of Eichmann and planned trial called a mockery of justice, not to mention the international outrage that Argentina's sovereignty had been violated in his capture. Forget about the fact that Eichmann had, created un had caused unspeakable crimes against the Jewish people. World opin opinion couldn't conscience a Jewish state with the power to seek justice for crimes committed against their own people. Such hypocritical denouncements of Israel reached their ugly apotheosis with the image of a swastika embedded in a Star of David in a satirical Soviet magazine. Zionism had become worse than Nazism, for whereas Nazi crimes appear, occurred in some remote past, the Zionist outrage continued. In Leffler's words, Zionism itself was put on trial in the symbolic court of human rights. There's more to say. Leffler's book is a must read, and if you are wondering, yes, I've already invited him to address our community. In simple terms, the story he relates is a story of how three forces, the struggle against anti-Semitism, the recasting of Zionists, a fungible word for the anti-Semite providing cover from charges of Jew hatred as colonial oppressors, and the world's inability to countenance a Jewish state who could and would stand up for itself, converging into a perfect and toxic storm that would put pit Jews and the Jewish state in direct opposition to the progressive agenda. There may have been a time, lest we forget, that human rights and Zionism were seen as two sides of the same coin. It's not a coincidence that in 1948, Jewish hands penned both Israel's Declaration of Independence and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But it was an alliance that was not to last long. The events of 1960, a backdrop for a world inhospitable to the proposition that Jews could lay claim to the universal and particular, the progressive and paro parochial strands of their DNA. Sixty years later, it's tempting to think that the challenges on our campuses, in our high schools, and now even in our middle schools of BDS, intersectionality, Britain's Labour Party under Corbyn, or our own political environment are new. It's tempting to lay blame for the Democratic Party's increasingly lukewarm support for Israel on the toxic bromance between Trump and Netanyahu. No question the Israeli and American administrations are not doing the world any favors lately, and anyone who knows me and my politics knows just how horrified I am at the death of the two-state solution. But to think that somehow it's the policy 
of the Israeli government this or that peace plan proposed by the U.S. administration that is the root of our present day challenges misses the longer arc of the story. The events of 1960 are significant because they demonstrate that the challenges of our day are not new, that they're not prompted by any one news cycle, leader, or annexation plan. 1960 came before 1967, before the Six Day War, before the occupation of the West Bank, before Oslo, before Netanyahu, before Trump, before intersectionality, white privilege, before all of these things. 1960 reflects a world which, like our own today, tells Jews that unlike any other people, they should not have the right to self-defense, that they should not have the right to self-determination, and that their expectation of either only serves to reveal their unseemly and parochial privilege and national chauvinism. This is what the world told the Jews in 1960. This is what the world is telling Jews today. And this is arguably what the world has been telling Jews since our very founding as a nation when we left Egypt in this week's Torah reading. After hundreds of years of servitude under the yoke of Pharaoh's oppression, the children of Israel crossed the sea from slavery to freedom, a tribe of our own finally en route to the promised land, a place to call our home. And yet scarcely has we crossed the sea when along comes Amalek attacking us, telling us that we were one tribe too many, that we should go back to where we came from, the place from which we had fled. As our B'nai Mitzvah taught, rabbinic tradition doesn't lack for explanations as to what Amalek represents, the ancient anti-Semitic enemy of our people. From this week's reading to Haman to Hitler himself. This year, I would ask you to consider that Amalek represents a pernicious and perennial claim heard in every generation that there is something untoward for a Jew to want the very thing every person and every nation wants, safety and self-determination. Amalek as the ugly and untrue allegation that for a Jew to defend him or herself is somehow unseemly and in conflict with a commitment to building a just society. Amalek as the act of denying the Jew the right to live in peace in one's sovereign homeland. It's the noxious contention that a Jew's right to their home is less valid than anyone else's. Amalek as a progressive world that prizes equity and inclusion for everyone, everyone that is, except Jews. A world that prizes diversity in just about everything, except, of course, diversity of opinion. A world willing to celebrate its liberalism, except when it comes at the expense of its own unchallenged orthodoxies. Sometimes Amalek makes no bones about its intentions, attacking us openly on our journeys. Sometimes, as in 1960, Amalek disguised itself, cloaked in the language of anti-colonialism or human rights. Sometimes, as it is today, it arrives in the form of a progressive vocabulary of intersectionality. It can come from our enemies, and yes, it can come from within our own ranks. It goes by different names, but it has been there for every generation from the beginning, the anti-Semitic claim that the only good Jew is a powerless Jew. Some people say history repeats itself, others that it rhymes. Interesting as the question may be, far more interesting is how we respond to our present circumstances as we understand them today. As I stated a few weeks ago, I believe it is the obligation of Jews to stand strong and stand together in the face of anyone who would do harm to any member of our community, no matter what kippah they do or don't wear. I believe it's the obligation of all Jews to call out anti-Semitism, whether it comes from the right or the left, brazen or sly, refusing to make allowance or alliance for either in the name of any short-term or injudicious gain. I believe that Zionism, the right of the Jewish people to a sovereign homeland, 
is a self-evident right and a Jewish obligation to defend. I believe that the nation state of Israel, like all nation states on this earth, is deeply imperfect. And my calling out the imperfections of Israel make me no less a Zionist than my criticisms of the United States make me any less a patriot. I believe the fact that I believe myself to have journeyed from Egypt means that I have an obligation to my covenanted people and to the stranger in my midst. And these obligations are part and parcel of my being. I believe that these beliefs, clear as they are to me, are not clear to all Jews, certainly not in the face of anti-Semites, and that it's the obligation of Jewish educational institutions, this one included to position our youth to enter a world with the vocabulary, sophistication, and information capable of responding to the inhospitable thought communities that await them. Most of all, I believe it's the obligation of every Jewish family to instill in their children a love of Judaism and a love of Israel so that whatever their future holds, they will be proud and knowledgeable of who they are, of who their people are, of where they came from, and what it is they are fighting for. Friends, our era doesn't lack for challenges, but for those with an eye to such things, in the wide arc of Jewish history, the decades of our lives are probably as good as it gets and has gotten. If it is to remain that way, if we are to ensure that to be the case for our children and grandchildren, we dare not sit complacent. There is work to be done there are challenges to be addressed. No different than any generation, Amalek remains in our midst. Let's be vigilant, let's fight the good fight, and let's plant the seeds for our shared future. Shabbat Shalom.